So it is a frosty and very cold morning and my studio is a tip. This is the state that I left it in last night. And I've come in today and I am looking at the three paintings that I spent the whole of yesterday working on. And in this fresh morning light, I think they are all awful. 24 hours ago, I came in and proceeded to have the best 24 hours, well, 20 hours of painting that I have had the whole year. Everything just went right. It was fantastic. I was fully in the flow. I was enjoying the whole process. I can't even recall some of the bits of these paintings. I was just really in that moment and it was just the best day. The output of that day, as I come in and look today, begs the question of whether or not it affects my enjoyment of yesterday, knowing that I don't like the output of it. And the short answer is no. And my only regret is that I left the studio in quite such a mess, but I figured as I tidy it up over the next 10 or so minutes, I would just talk about something I feel we are losing in a kind of cultural language about how there is such a unique difference between process and outcome when it comes to any creative endeavor and that the value is often placed in the wrong category. And that is the reason why so many people who would actually gain great value from being creative don't because they find themselves so attached to the outcome that they don't see that actually that is where zero of the value of making art is. I first noticed this idea quite a long time ago. And I think it's a kind of important one to discuss. Obviously, if you wish to share, sell, or show your art, you need to be focused in some level on output. And yet the greatest artists of all time, if you read about them and you listen to what they had to say, those who broke into great new ground rarely ever found themselves worried too much about that side of things. They were much more just loving the process. And I first noticed this years ago when I used to work in a arts charity and we used to go around the county and do loads of arts events and fairs. And we would have these panel boards that we would erect and they would be about 20 meters wide, 20 foot wide, 30 foot wide and eight foot high. And it was just the greatest thing ever. We would do drawing lessons, graffiti lessons, art lessons, and we would have everyone coming over and you can imagine it, all the kids along the lower levels and the scribbles and then gradually as it got taller, you'd have the slightly tighter drawings by the adults at the top. But what I noticed is the kids who enjoyed it the most would be the ones who would come and they would be frantically into, or really neatly into, fully absorbed. And the moment they were done, after maybe five or 10 minutes, they would drop their pen and they would be on to the next thing at the fair. They wouldn't even look back. Obviously, there were some kids who would come and want to learn something technical. So they would want to learn how to draw a Spider-Man. And we would sit and we would plan it out with them and they would be really proud of the output. And that's fantastic. That's something to be proud of. And they would come back later with their parents and take a photo of their Spider-Man. And I don't mean to belittle that way of doing things. I think you that kid has learnt a technical skill and should be happy. 
And yet, in terms of a daily artistic practice, if that kid were to come back every single day and see the value in his output, he wouldn't last very long. For every success only comes from failure, even if you are judging things on output, which my whole purpose in this little tidying up spiel is to say is totally misplaced. The way of thinking is like that first kid who was just involved and then detached. And what was quite funny is as this board got higher, you would get to these kind of, not quite teenager, maybe 10 to 12 year olds, and their parents would have to persuade them to engage. And they'd bring them over and they'd be like, go on, Jimmy, do that thing. We know you love drawing, do that thing. Oh, sorry, he's just a little bit shy. And eventually you would coax Jimmy over and he'd get drawing and he'd be happy. And then you'd take two pens, you'd go back to the parents and you'd just hand it to them and point to the top of the board and they would go, oh no, I can't draw. And I'd be stood there looking at Jimmy, looking at the kid and going, can you not see as he got older where the hesitation has come from? And then any adults who would engage in the top were adults who already had some control of the output. They knew what they wanted to make. They would come up and they would draw something that they knew how to draw. They were in control. Very rarely do you see some wild creative process along the top two foot of this board. Now I ran these classes, or this, this course quite a few times, and there was one notable time when it was very, very different. And that was when we did it down on a beach and we sacrificed the boards for the wonderful flat sand as the tide had gone out. So with a sharp stick, I carved half a football pitch out and the engagement on that was like nothing I've ever seen. You didn't even have to try and coax the adults in. Everyone was drawing. Granddad got involved, all the little kids were involved. They were mixing things up, going over each other's work. It was just wonderful. And I truly believe the only reason that it was different is that I told everyone they only had an hour because the tide was coming in. So there was no fear of their results being tied to output because it was all gonna be gone. The other time I've seen this is when we used to do what was called a fire column. And that fire column was fantastic. It was a great big burning column and people would write stuff and you would scribble down something and you'd place it in and it would just burn and it's gone. And the greatest thing that we did with it was a drawing lesson where you gave people five minutes to draw, which may not sound like a long time, but it's a really long time. And you would say, nobody is gonna see what you draw because we're gonna burn it straight away afterwards. So you can do whatever you like. And the same thing would happen every time. First minute, everyone would be giggling and laughing and all the teenagers would be desperate to show their friends the terribly inappropriate thing they were inevitably drawing. But then after a minute, the same thing always used to happen and their faces would slightly change and this strange serenity would come over them. And I've never quite been able to articulate it or understand it, but there was some complete freedom of creativity and value in this process because they knew the output didn't matter. They couldn't keep it, no one else was gonna see it. Just like the tide washing away the pictures in the sand. And I always think sometimes on days like today with these three pictures, that it's almost unfortunate <laughs> that when you paint, you're left with a painting. <laughs> For example, this morning I went on a run and I always wonder what would happen if on a run you were left with a little memento of your run that was indicative of how well you thought the run had gone. I would always find myself wanting to just throw it in the trash as I took off my trainers, but what if you had to, this physical item you had to deal with in the real world? I would always say on mine, maybe, you know, this is my recovery pace, or I ate too many mince pies. But it's, <laughs> it's something that people do because they get something else from it. It's the same thing with meditation, and there's a uniquely good example with something like yoga. 
And before I explain that, the, the thing I really struggle with is people who say they have this kind of creative block or writer's block or anything like this, because you don't get plumber's block. And like anyone who does anything involved in creativity, obviously you need to take time away from it. It takes a lot from you. But ultimately, if you treat it like an artist, like an artisan and treat it as work, anyone knows that inspiration is kind of a myth and the inspiration only ever comes from the work. But the thing that they don't really always engage with is that the times when they're struggling the most are often the times when they need to do it the most and the outcome is gonna be the worst. So I've not done yoga in a year. And I know that that first session back, if anyone were to watch me as a example of good practice, it will be awful. However, it will be the most valuable session to me because I haven't done it in a while and my mind is messy and my body is tight. So it will have the most value in that process of me re-entering it, just like going on my first run after Christmas. And it's the same with painting. The times when you're most stuck and you most can't get anything out of it is the time you need to do it. And it's fine if you don't connect yourself with output. Oh, the people who I speak to who seem to best understand this idea all tend to be religious. And I wonder if that's because the religious idea is often you sacrifice much time to worship and it doesn't have the same, I don't know how to really say it, tangible, kind of real world, this world reward. And so they understand much more <laughs> about this kind of creative side of things. This is among people who, who don't, they maybe enjoy art, but they don't make it. And they once said to me that there are many old stories in religions that place within them morals that have been proven to be timeless. Now, I've always leant slightly on the side of someone like Tim Minchin, who would say in one of his comedy songs, just because ideas are tenacious, it doesn't mean that they're worthy. But as I've got older, I've started to realize that perhaps, as someone else told me, traditions and traditional stories might be solutions to problems long forgotten. And if you abandon the tradition and you forget the story, slowly the problem re-emerges and it can take generations but that if there are stories where the morality is most unclear in a modern age that may be where something is missing or misunderstood and to me just like how great art can hold these intangible values i think it's worth exploring and the story that is most confusing to me that I want to try and tie here into process and outcome is the story of Cain and Abel, who were the sons of Adam and Eve. Now, I'm no expert, but the basic story is they're the first two people, if you like, and they both made their own individual sacrifices to God. Cain, the eldest, who I am gonna, in this analogy, slightly convolutedly, call the embodiment of focusing on output was a farmer and Abel who I'm going to say is process was a shepherd and they would both offer sacrifices however Cain who knew what he wanted from his crops wouldn't sacrifice anything that would too much sabotage his final yield whereas Abel would sacrifice always the first lamb of his season and God valued Abel's sacrifice and didn't value Cain's. And ultimately, Cain grew really bitter that his sacrifices were not valued and ended up murdering Abel. And the morality of this is a bit confusing to try and understand what, what's the story embedded in it that we're supposed to take from it. And these days, anytime you try and look for morality or stories in old, old religions, especially Old Testament stories, it's hard because so much around that religion is criticized and critiqued for not 
being appropriate for the modern age. But I do think there is some element where people are throwing the baby out with the bathwater on this because often there are things that are vitally important and been proven to work for ages that we may be dismissing at our peril. And hopefully in me kind of exploring this idea here, people might see and be able to help me with something because I'm not quite sure if I've got it on the nose, but there's definitely something there. Abel is very much involved in the process and he is willing to sacrifice to it and not worry so much about his final, his final outcome because he is sacrificing himself to something greater. And in this way, in my analogy, it's almost like the creative spirit. Abel is free because he is involved in process and he is not linked to output. He doesn't even mind that God, if God were to not like his sacrifice in the same way. He is, he is just doing his thing. Whereas Cain is needing both his crop to work because that is the good output and the approval of God. And ultimately his focus on needing that approval and that output leads him to become embittered and he murders his brother. He murders process, just like anyone who is maybe too focused on their creative endeavor, on their worship for a reward, for an output that they are pleased with, murders the process, murders where the true value is. I don't know if that fully works as an analogy, but I think it has some truth in it. And it's something that I'm going to try and work through today. I'm going to try and be able. I'm going to work on my pictures and just hope that something happens. It's a funny one because I don't really want to get murdered by the output, <laughs> murdered by Cain. But even if I were and I was to become obsessed with it, it's a weird one because God does not <laughs> punish Cain for murdering his brother. And this is Old Testament God. He did the whole worst things to everybody. So I don't know if it really makes sense, but it's something that I'm really interested in. And hopefully in this age when everyone is feeling pressure to share everything they do and people are kind of having these output focused fake lives that maybe, you know, if people just stop and do their own thing and just not link themselves too much to the output of it, they might find that creative spirit, their God and a value in it in, in a way that people of eras gone by have been trying to tell us through old stories that we have ignored or misinterpreted for a little bit too long. And we can look back and hopefully they'll help us. I don't know. Anyway, the morning has started and I need to crack on with these. So wish me luck. <laughs>